So welcome and thank you everybody for joining us today for the C2 Smart webinar. I am Lizzie, the Research Project Manager at the C2 Smart Center, a USDOT designated Tier 1 University Transportation Research Center. C2 Smart leverages recent advance, advances in big data and technology to solve today's most pressing urban mobility challenges. Today, we are joined by Haggai Davis, who will present on quantifying and visualizing city truck route network efficiency using a virtual test bed. And we're also joined by Professor Joseph Chow from NYU, who is the principal investigator of this research project and an associate professor in the Department of Civil and Urban Engineering and the deputy director of C2 Smart. Uh, some quick notes before we get started. We'll be recording this session and then uploading it to C2 Smart's YouTube channel. And I encourage everybody to participate today by asking questions. And you can do so by pressing the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom window. And then we will read out your questions at the end of the presentation. And again, our presenter is Hagai Davis, a third year PhD candidate at NYU who is researching urban freight. And this presentation represents the last year and a half of his work, and he's excited to use it as a foundation for future efforts. His ultimate goal is to understand how the future of mobility with automation, electrification, and connectivity will impact cities. And with that, I will hand things over to Professor Chow to get us started. Uh, thank you, Lizzie. Uh, so yeah, I wanted to just give a quick introduction to this uh, project uh, and, and then hand it off to Haggai to present on the details. Uh, but basically, this was a year five uh, C2Smart project, uh, actually um, uh, co-PI with uh, Professor Asbe. Uh, and so this was a, quite a substantial uh, uh, project uh, that also involved uh, um, uh, collaboration with New York City Department of Transportation. Uh, uh, and uh, we, uh, we it ended up producing a number of uh, uh, components out of this research, which included uh, not just the, uh, uh, the the presentation that you see here today, but also a component on uh, a truck routing app uh, that was uh, that was uh, uh, worked on uh, by the uh, by the team, and also involved a hackathon, uh, as well as uh, a parcel delivery model that we also have in the final report. Uh, so this final report should be coming out pretty soon. Uh, so look forward to that. Uh, it's in the draft process and uh, under review. Uh, so we're uh, just uh, getting some feedback and uh, making some final edits to it. Um, so with that, I'll uh, have Hagai uh, uh, begin the presentation. Uh, Hagai, go, uh, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. So yes, my name is Hagai Davis. Uh, as Dr. Chow said, this was a, a large work that took a lot of time. There are a lot of people who contributed to it, and so I'm very thankful to all of their help. Uh, specifically, I'll be focusing today on the synthetic freight population portion. Uh, and so assisting me on that were Hector Landes, Farnoosh Nandarpour, Ha Yang, and of course, Professor Chow. So the outline for today's presentation, uh, first we'll go through uh, some setup and some motivation. We'll talk about the methodology for how we developed our synthetic freight population, and then we'll examine it specifically in the New York City context. So getting into the setup and motivation, there's two major things that I want to dive into before we get going. Uh, and the first one is scale. So whenever we are doing transportation modeling, the scale of the model falls roughly into one of three buckets. Uh, so the first one would be a macro level scale. Uh, and so this is going to be longer time horizons, uh, larger regions, and we'll paint in broad brush strokes. The meso level uh, does what it says. It sits in the middle. Uh, it is much closer to a yearly time horizon. It will focus roughly at the city level. It will be able to distinguish units from each other, but the micro level has much more detail about individual units the day-to-day -day variation you'll see changes inside of that and usually the geography is also smaller in order to be able to process all this data however it can uh, with some new tools still be at the city level the other major concept that i wanted to define is a synthetic population so a synthetic population is a pool of distinguishable agents each with a set of traits such that the proportions mimic the real world breakdowns <clears throat> 
So take an example of Matsum NYC. Matsum NYC is a project that uh, the Built Lab has undertaken. And so it is designed to be able to model travelers moving across the city. And so each individual agent has an age, has an income, has a race, disability status, a home, a work or school, and they also partake in secondary activities. And so just to try and further add some details to this, for example, if in New York City, the average age is 25, then uh, in the synthetic freight pop, in the synthetic traveler population, the average age of their participants will also be 25. It's not necessarily that any one agent in the synthetic population is designed to mirror a real world person, but it's that they are designed to look like a real world population would look. So moving into the motivation. So why did we undertake this work? The goal is to capture and model the complex interactions of freight trucks in New York City. Uh, so freight delivery is increasing dramatically. The U.S. Department of Commerce estimates that there will be a 90% expected growth in e-commerce from 2020 to 2026. Uh, and so the New York City DOT is analyzing this problem and they've laid out several key free strategies to try and tackle this. Uh, the document Delivering New York uh, Smart Truck Management Plan is very much something that we were reading through and thinking about as we were developing this work. It lays out several goal areas uh, with two of them being sustainability and efficiency. And I have, you know, inside of those goal areas, the subtasks that I believe that our model will be able to help address more specifically. Getting down to SR11 is reducing the impact and incidence of overnight truck parking on residential communities. Later on, I'll be able to dive into how we use our model to better answer that question. Uh, also, the um, New York Metropolitan Transportation Council, or NIMTIN, uh, thinks a lot about freight in New York City. And so one of their tools is the NYBPM or the New York Best Practices Model. It is a regional level, mid to long-term general traffic planning model. So you can see there the picture which shows the area that they're considering. It also is looking at time horizons of decades. They'll, they look at 2040 and 2050. And also they do make freight considerations, but they are more focused on general traffic movements as opposed to having freight be their primary focus of that model. They do have a primary freight focus in the Regional Transportation Plan Appendix H, but it is a planning document. It is not necessarily a model. It also focuses on economics as opposed to having transportation be the primary focus. And it's also multimodal. So it looks at how do ports interact with rails, interact with freight trucks, and interact with air freight? And so our model is going to focus specifically on freight trucks. Moving into the methodology. So this is a flowchart which uh, outlines our total process. The dark purple are the three primary outputs. The light purple are the tasks performed, and then the white boxes are the input data sets. So we use a, a lot of public data. Uh, there is data fusion that happens, a lot of data cleaning uh, that will produce initially our estimated freight trips produced and freight trips attracted by the transportation analysis zone and by the freight industry. We will then distribute those flows uh, by entry maximization into tours. We will then assign attributes to the tours and that will lead us to the synthetic population. And then the goal is for future works to take the synthetic population and place it into MATSIM with that MATSIM NYC project. So getting into the freight trip generation, the NAICS, the North American Industry Classification System, breaks down industries into two main components. The first one is freight intensive and then non-freight intensive. So whenever we were considering this project, we considered primarily freight intensive and we did not consider the non-freight intensive because the freight intensive made up 95% of all the freight delivered. And so whenever you start to look at that last 5% distributed amongst a lot of different industries, the signal to noise ratio grew very large and it became difficult to accurately make models of what was happening in each of those individual uh, 
industries. So that's why we primarily focused on the freight intensive sectors. So there's a lot happening in this slide, um, but what you really just need to take away from it is the idea that the freight generated for each business is proportional to the employment. So being able to understand the levels of employment, the types of employment, where they are, those are all very important details. And this slide outlines the different conditions when you use certain equations, different parameters you would need. But the big takeaway here is that the amount of freight business needs is determined by its employment. So once we have our freight, we then need to assign it to tours. So the first thing that we do is we establish the tour length. Each industry has its own unique average length and its own unique shape. We use this function to construct that. Once we have the length of the tour, first we pick uh, an origin, we then pick destinations. Now, one of the things that was really important for us to do is to make sure that our tours were clustered together. So we wanted our origins and destinations to be geographically near each other in order to better represent actual truck tour behavior. It doesn't make sense for one truck to deliver freight down in Staten Island and in the North Bronx and in Flushing, Queens, because those are three very disparate locations and it's just not optimal. So introducing this weighting factor really helped us to have more realistic tour behavior. And then finally, you can see an image of what these tours would look like. So we have a blue tour, a red tour, and a green tour. And so you can see the legs are numbered as the truck moves throughout its route. So how do we actually assign the trucks onto tours? This is the process of entropy maximization. So try and build some intuition about what does entropy maximization actually mean. The goal here is to create a mesostate, which has the most number of microstates, which could comprise it. Basically, our goal is not necessarily to describe every detail in the most accurate, most rich way, but we want a state that has a reasonable enough amount of detail inside of it, and that has a lot of different microstates that could be represented in that way when you abstract up, because we believe that is likely to be a representation here. So getting into a little bit of the math, uh, we have the equation at the top, which is our primary objective equation, and then we have our constraints. So again, this might be dense to try and parse, but what's happening with our constraints, the first one, is basically that OI term is the number of freight trucks that we are predicting in the real world. And we're tr trying to have the number of trucks that we assign on each tour to each location be equal to that number. That FJ is the amount of freight that we believe is in the real world. And we would like the amount of freight that we assign to our tours to be equal to that number. The last equation I wanna point out is the fourth one. And that is the relationship between Y and T. And so that is using that factor H, which is just the amount of tons per truck. So whenever you have the tons per truck times the tons, uh, times the trucks, you get the amount of tons. The rest of the equations are there to make the overall process work or the kind of bookkeeping. But the things I want to draw your attention to most are the, the trucks and the freight and the relationship between the two. So how do we actually solve that, this setup? Normally what you would do is you would take this and you would plug it into pre-built software packages, but for a variety of reasons, we were unable to use those. So we had to develop our own. Uh, so for those of you who remember your traffic engineering, this process will ultimately look a lot like the freighter method. So what we do is you first make a, a very simple uh, assumption about how the trucks will be distributed, you have your zones are your columns and your tours are your rows. For each row, you will sit there and you will sum across and that gives you your sum of your TM. And then you check to see against that OI term, does your TM equal your OI? It's very likely to not. And so what you will do is you will multiply each individual cell by a proportional factor, 
so that whenever you go back and resum all the way across, your TM does equal to your OI. Next, you come back with your columns and you do the same process. And you look to see whenever you sum all the way across, you get your YJM and you check your uh, sum YJM against your freight FJ. And again, it's unlikely to be equal. So you multiply by a proportional factor. However, because we've just changed every cell all the way across, we then go back and check our TMs again, and it's unlikely that they're equal. So we multiply by another proportional factor uh, all the way across, and you go back and forth uh, with your rows and your columns, iteratively balancing them uh, with the idea in mind that as you do this process multiple times, you will converge towards a solution. And so this figure on the right is that convergence happening. So our point that we chose was we wanted the average change in freight assigned to each cell to drop below a certain threshold. In this case, you can see the threshold that we have picked is 0.1 tons per cell. And so that first iteration to the second iteration, you see a large change. But as we get towards the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, that change really starts to shrink. And so that is why we believe that that 0.1 threshold was actually a useful threshold. Getting into the synthetic freight population. So there are two ways to structure it. Uh, they're very similar to each other. The first one is just a more condensed version of the second. Uh, it is tour based. So each row represents a unique tour. You'll notice that the industries are different, that the start times are very different, the travel times are different. Uh, whereas the agent based is each row represents one truck. So in the tour based, we have the column for flow, and that is the number of trucks which take that tour, whereas in the agent base, we don't have the flow because each row is one truck. We notice that all the start times are very close together, but uh, we notice that all the travel times are the same. And that goal there is just capturing that these are each individual agents making this tour. So this slide, I realize there's a lot happening here. What I want to try and do here is pull all of this together in one place. I realize that there's been a lot happening so far, and I want this to try and help understand what can we know about one truck. This isn't everything that we can know about one truck, just because there's, there's so much it would be overwhelming to put on a single slide, but these are some important pieces and I think will help set the groundwork for understanding uh, on future slides, what do we know, how do we know it? So this truck starts his day at 5.49 a.m. Uh, and his trip begins at the depot uh, for the zone 118. We see that he is in AICS industry 22. He will be that industry for the entire day. The tour time and the trip time are equal so far because this is his first leg. We see he starts the day with 3.4 tons of freight remaining. And we see the amount of CO2 that has been emitted so far in metric tons of carbon equivalent. As we move to trip three, we see that it has been 3.6 hours of total tour time, and thus it is 9.41 a.m. We see that he is arriving at zone 331. We see he's delivered roughly half his total freight, which makes sense because he is roughly halfway through his tour. And we can see how much CO2 has been emitted. When we look at trip four, one of the things we notice is that there is the arrival and departure and that he's not traveled any distance in between them, but there is a time between them. This is designed to represent the service time for each truck, that whenever the truck arrives at the drop-off location, the dock workers come, they unload, there's paperwork to sign, there are just things that take place. And so we wanna make sure we capture that service time because that's also where truck parking happens that's where truck double parking happens. Mm -hmm. And so this is how we gain access at that uh, quantity, that's concept that we're trying to model. We also notice that the origin for trip four is zone 331, which is the same as the destination for trip three. And so this is the idea of trip chaining. That's one trip links into the next one. This is the backbone of a lot of urban freight modeling today. And this helps us make a better, more complete picture of how trucks actually move to the city as opposed to being sporadic one-off drop-offs. Finally, we see in, in trip six that it has been 7.1 total hours of tour time. 
Thus, it is 12.54 p.m. We see he has zero freight remaining to drop off. Uh, and by returning to the depot, that is zone 118, which is where he began his trip. And we see that the total amount of metric tons of carbon emitted was 1.62 e to the minus 2. 1.6 e to the minus 2, or 0 0.0016 tons of metric tons of carbon. So there are other things that we also could know about the truck. We could know what borough it's in. We could know uh, the speed it's traveling. We could know the distance it's traveling. There are, you know, we know the the weight at the time, but this is just an example of what we can know throughout the day. So now that we understand what a synthetic freight population looks like, let's examine it in terms of New York City specifically. So we inputted a lot of public data. And so there are a couple of main sources that I want to call out here. The first one is NCFRP 25. This is a freight report which uh, set a lot of the groundwork for estimating how much freight is generated. And we definitely were looking at this and thinking about this a lot throughout our work. Uh, another one would be the primary land use tax output for New York City, also known as the Pluto data set. And then the census. We made use of a lot of census data in building this work. So the study area, uh, so you can see on the left, there are 574 zones throughout New York City. This was built by another work from uh, the built lab. And then on the right, you can see the OpenStreetMap network. So OpenStreetMap is an open source GIS database that has maps for virtually the entire globe at this point, but we only wanted the New York City cutout of that. It's important to note, though, that we did not just use the OpenStreetMap network. We augmented it with data from New York City DOT, specifically the truck routes. Uh, so we prioritized vehicles taking the truck routes by weighting them more heavily. We also included truck restrictions. And then we then added uh, link speed data so that trucks would be able to understand how fast they were going. And just to paint a picture of why this is important, these two uh, frames, the left one is from Google Maps, the right one is our custom network, begin at the same point and end at the same point. But because Google does not know that this is a truck, it suggests a local route which would travel under the uh, elevated subway lines at multiple locations. And the elevated subway lines are not above a certain height, so the trucks cannot pass there. Thus, our network recommends the truck heads to the freeway and bypasses a lot of these route networks. It bypasses the local network as much as possible and stays on the designated truck routes. The employment data here, uh, again, we looked at the public land use tax output and we combined it with the American Census Survey. There also were a lot of exception handling. There was a lot of edge cases that need to be tackled. Uh, for example, some individual buildings required their own process, such as the Empire State Building. Uh, and a lot of this data work was done by Hector Landes, and I really do need to shout him out here. He spent a lot of time and a lot of effort reading through a lot of uh, rows, a lot of records. He did a lot because the outputs from New York City are not necessarily the cleanest data sets. And so I really am thankful for him and the work that he did in order to build a good data set for us to import into this model. And again, once we have established all of our employment at the lot level, we aggregate it up to the level of the zones that I mentioned earlier. And this is how we will get to estimating our freight trips generated via the equations that I also mentioned earlier. So once we have our predictions, it's important that we check our predictions versus real world data. So the first set of predictions that we made was about employment. And so first we look at our employment by borough. And so we are very happy with our predictions at four, four of the five boroughs. Manhattan is a little bit of an outlier. We see there at about 10% error, we overestimated. However, this is due to the difference between the ways that Manhattan is zoned and the ways that it is actually used. And it would not be possible to go back and shrink this error without a lot of ad hoc methods that didn't feel justifiable on a broader scale. But ultimately, even then, our total error is about 
which is a very comfortable number. We also look at the employment by industry and across the different industries, we're again, very happy with the ultimate outcome. Once we have our employments, we run it through those equations and we get the number of freight trips that are produced. So that first table uh, compares in CFRP 25, the estimated freight trips per borough versus our work. And so we notice that the total numbers, they're about 7% difference. We are a little underestimating them. For four of the five boroughs, we're actually very close in the total number of estimates, but we do estimate fewer trips from Manhattan than they do. But one of the things that methodologically they did differently than us was that they did not separate out freight that was generated inside of New York City versus freight that entered New York City from a gateway. And so this is one of the places wherever we just made different assumptions. And so that's part of why you see that discrepancy in the borough level estimation. Below that, you see our numbers estimated the amount of freight trips produced and attracted for each industry. The important thing to note here is that for none of the industries is the freight produced directly equal to the freight attracted. This is very reasonable. Because we estimated them separately, there's no particular reason that they should be directly equal. However, whenever we get into the assignment process, all of the freight that is produced has to be delivered somewhere. So we do have to ultimately set them equal to each other. And that process of going through and setting them equal ended up adding about 50,000 trips or about 8%. And our final number of trips that we distributed was 724,000. And this is very close to that NCFRP number of 718,000. And so this fact that going through two different methodologies, we ended up with numbers that were very close together to each other, I think lends credence to both of these works. Spatially distributing the freight trips here. On the left side, we see the freight trips that are produced in New York City. On the right, we see where they are attracted. And so the left side figure calls out the gateways. Uh, we, so we see interstates, we see the George Washington Bridge, we see routes coming in from Staten Island, we see routes coming in from Long Island. And then on the right, we see uh, high freight attraction zones. So these are things like major ports, major consuming areas. Uh, and so the fact that they are real life high freight attractors that we're also seeing in our model show up uh, lends us to believe that we are on the right track here. Once we have our freight trips estimated, we need to start assigning them onto our tours. We need to start seeing how does this match up versus the real world. So earlier I mentioned that we use this waiting term uh, to assign, to constrain and cluster our tours so that theta parameter is a calibrated parameter. And so we considered four different values and ultimately we settled on that 0.75 number as our value because it was not only the most overall accurate, our error was distributed both roughly above and below. And so, whereas the other values were either skewing too high or skewing too low. And so the method that we looked at was the borough boundary crossings. So we looked at how much freight is crossing you know, from Manhattan into Queens, from Brooklyn into Staten Island, et cetera, in both directions, because we aggregated to the borough level as opposed to individual bridges, because our work was more at the that mesoscopic level, trying to understand flows between boroughs. We weren't necessarily trying to predict which individual roads would trucks travel on, but trying to get a sense of where the movements were happening from and where the movements were going to. So looking at that borough boundary crossing figure, we are very happy with a lot of the borough interactions. So between the Bronx and Queens, between Queens and Brooklyn, and Brooklyn and Staten Island, we are very happy with all of those numbers. One of the places that we have larger error, though, is between Brooklyn and Manhattan and Manhattan and Queens. Those tours that cross the East River are overrepresented. We see just a lot more freights predicted crossing the those bridges than measured in the real world. 
However, this is an acceptable outcome ultimately. One, because it is a result of the choices that we made. Whenever we introduced this clustering, that's part of what introduced this error in this way, that because those three boroughs are tied together spatially more tightly than the other boroughs are, that's part of why you see that. And also, ultimately, the goal of this model is to show changes, to show patterns, to show flows whenever we start to make policy changes. And so if we were to have error, we would rather be slightly overestimated than slightly underestimated because we want that chance to see the differences from our policy changes. Earlier, I also mentioned the document delivering New York City, the Smart Truck Management Plan. They also put out numbers for uh, freight crossings uh, at the borough locations. They picked different locations than we did for our validation, but because we spent a lot of time thinking about that document, it was important for us to validate against what they did. So one of the things that they did differently in their document was they picked gateway locations, whereas we picked entirely internal locations. They also picked fewer total locations as they were focusing on either the top four or top five points, whereas we picked as many as we thought would be reasonable. And so ultimately, we see that for Staten Island, Manhattan, and Queens, we are very happy. Uh, they find that, according to their methodology, our Bronx trips would be a little underestimated and our Brooklyn trips would be a little overestimated. According to this, we agree that our Brooklyn trips are overestimated, but because our Bronx trips on this methodology actually came out very close, we did not necessarily feel that we needed to make further changes, even though through this uh, validation strategy, it would have shown too few trips leaving the Bronx. So now that we have validated our model against the real data, we wanted to start looking at how did it describe the real world. And so we looked at the truck flow impacts. So we looked at travel distance, travel time, and CO2 emissions. So uh, notice that they are all densities. So we normalized each of them by the zone area in order to have it not just be a container effect. Uh, and so we see the travel times and travel uh, distances in the expected places. Also, it's important to note that whenever we were calculating CO2 emissions, we use this equation, which is from Bagazi and Figliozzi 2013. Uh, and it is mostly a function of speed and individual vehicle parameters. And so that is why that length level data that we had from the Uber movement data set was important is that it allowed us to calculate this CO2 emissions as well as understand travel times on the individual links. We also wanted to understand truck parking, as I mentioned earlier. And so the figure on the left aggregates to the borough level uh, by different times of day. And so we see that uh, Brooklyn uh, in that PM peak from four to 7 PM is really whenever you have the most service time happening. That is wherever you're going to see the most double parking. And again, this is normalized by container size. So it really is a density that really is the hot spot there. On the right, you see the daily service times. And once again, we actually see a lot of our hotspots popping up, the same hotspots that we saw in the freight trip attracted um, figure from earlier. So the fact that at different points in time in our model, we're still seeing real world problem location, real world activity locations show up is evidence that we are on the right track here. So now that we have described the real world as it is, and we're able to talk about certain things, we then want to move into what is happening with changes. So one of the changes that we wanted to examine was a 20% truck capacity reduction. So the reason that we wanted to consider something like that is in New York City, a lot of our bridges, a lot of our tunnels, a lot of our roads are older. And so preservation is an important part of that. At C2 Smart, we have a project with New York City DOT trying to understand and extend the life of the Brooklyn Queens Expressway, a location that's actually very close here to campus. 
the original design was built in 1944, and we are very near the end of the intended service life. And so New York City is trying its best to do what it can to extend the service life of that area. So by reducing the truck capacity, you would be able to extend the life. So what we see here is the equation for the equivalent single axle load. This is developed by Ashto. And so what you notice is that the vehicle weights uh, to the fourth power. So that fourth power is very important because it means that the damage is dramatically increasing once you go above that level. But it also means that once you drop below that 18,000 number, your damage is going to dramatically decrease. And so by shrinking the truck capacity, we expect to see significant improvements. We pick two different locations that are marked on the map there, the Queens Midtown Tunnel and the Manhattan Bridge. And in both cases, you can see the truck flow go up by about 25%, which is what you'd expect when you reduce the capacity by 20%. And so we also see, though, that the damage done, even though there are more trucks crossing the bridge, the damage significantly drops. The fact that our damage is down by 45% would mean a significant extension to the life of these bridges and these roadways. However, this comes with a cost. That you now have 25% more trucks on your roads and on your bridges, and so you would see your VMT increase, you would see your CO2 emissions increase, you would see your service times increase. And so that is really what we wanted to get at with our model here, is we wanted to be able to capture the complexities and the trade-offs. Because freight is complicated. There's a lot of different actors at play. There's a lot of different stakes here. And there are many factors that need to be balanced against each other. And so we wanted to be able to capture all of this, and we want to be able to describe this and place this information into the hands of decision makers in a way that whenever they are trying to evaluate what they believe is best for the public, they have the best information available to them. And so the future efforts for this work will include integrating this work into Matsum NYC that has already begun. The current version uh, focuses specifically on passenger flows and has the truck traffic as background. By adding synthetic freight population into this, we'll be able to explicitly model those. Additionally, we're also considering truck electrification. We believe that the urban freight ecosystem is on the verge of being electrified. And so we want to study in New York City, uh, are there range impacts? One of the concerns people have is are battery ranges long enough to make all the deliveries? You know, we just talked about the importance of weight on New York City roads. Electric vehicle batteries are heavy. And so strapping this additional several thousand pounds onto the trucks, what is the impact of that on the damage to the roads? And lastly, because we have so much rich industry-specific information, are there some industries which are better suited to electrification than others? So thank you for listening to my presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, you can go to C2Smart's uh, website. You can email that website. You can contact me directly. Again, I want to thank C2Smart for being able to support my work, the Built Lab for supporting my work, NYU for supporting my work, uh, and all the people who assisted me in contributing this. If there are any questions, I will take them now. Thank you, Hagai. <coughs> As a reminder, we invite questions. So please enter yours by pressing the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom window. And we have one right now. So the question is, is there any real world data that you need to use to generate tours besides your mathematical model? There's a two-parter, so we'll start with that. <clears throat> yes, um, we use... Uh... So to generate the mathematical model itself, I will go back through to the slide. Let's see. Uh, we looked at tour lengths, uh, and that was data. So this would be captured in this um, C number. That's for each individual industry. We tried our best to find uh, an average number of stops uh, per tour 
And that would be one um, other piece of information. So, and then again, that's the uh, supplemented by all the employment data that we turned into the freight data that we turned into the trip data. And could you introduce the role of the real world data in trip generation and how important it is? In other words, if the data is not enough, then you still run MATSIM and get a reasonable outcome. Let's see. Here's the role of the real data in trip generation. Yes. So the. We believe that the real world data plays a validating role in our models. And so we wanted to be able to model enough data <clears throat> to put it, what we have into MATSIM and then check against our outcomes. The real world data served as an input and a validation check, but the model itself should contain enough so that whenever we input it into MATSIM, we can run through MATSIM and get a, a reasonable output and then check that MATSIM output also against real world data. Great. So it looks like that is the only question. If anybody has one, you can enter it now. All right, well, thank you everybody for joining and to Hagai and Professor Chow for presenting at today's webinar. A recording will be made available on the center's YouTube channel and website. And again, this webinar was brought to you by C2 Smart and USDOT's University Transportation Center program. So thank you again, everyone, and have a good one. Thank you. Bye.